the Nintendo 64 era was kind of a weird time in gaming. It was the first true attempt at 3D graphics by Nintendo, and a lot of developers were still trying to map that idea to a controller. And it didn't help that the N64 controller was an awkward mess of buttons and squid legs. I feel like a lot of games that came out from that era just aren't remembered as fondly because they didn't control well or just got lost in the shuffle of games from that system. Since, while there wasn't a huge library for it, most people didn't dive deeper than the Mario 64s, Zelda Ocarina of Time, Smash Bros, and maybe a few other key titles. I honestly fall into that category as well. My brother and I got RN64 from a small local pawn shop late into its life, along with Mortal Kombat Trilogy and Mario Kart 64, and the only other games we got for it over time were whatever our mom would buy for us, which was usually budget titles, but did admittedly include some heavy hitters like Smash Bros. and Pokemon Stadium. We also got whatever was available to rent, back when renting was still a thing. I never even owned Mario 64 or Goldeneye. I just played them a lot at my friends' houses. Because of this, a lot of my knowledge of the system has come later. Either from emulation as I've gotten older, or through games others remember fondly and told me all about, even though I've never played them. So, to make this list a little more relevant, I've asked retro gamer and good friend Viji Dad to join me for this list as the resident in 64 expert. Well, those are some highly sarcastic quotes. Hey, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt compared to me. Let's dive a little bit more into your history of the N64, though, before we start the list. Well, I've been a hardcore Nintendo kid since the NES. I still distinctly remember when the N64 came out and being super hyped about it. I only got a handful of opportunities to play, mostly at kiosks, at Toys R Us, RIP, or a few occasions at friends' houses. Christmas of 1996 rolled around, and my brother and I were given two N64 games, Mario 64 and Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey. Naturally, we were confused since we didn't have the system, but then my dad rolled out with the system itself. We were still confused and didn't have the jumping out of our chairs reaction that I'm sure he expected, but we eventually got wrapped up in the hype. My mom worked at a video rental store, and one of the perks was free rentals. This was a great opportunity for me to pick up and play some weird games that I might not have otherwise played. I could take a game home, play it for five minutes, and if it stinks, I'm not out five bucks, which is a lot when you're 12. But if it was a hidden gem, I had a whole weekend with it. So as you can see, between the two of us, we are the go-to authority for the more obscure N64 games. So, we're going to kick it off with an honorable mention of a game that's not as underrated, but definitely underappreciated, and as I recall, is a favorite of both of ours. Donkey Kong 64. What are you talking about? I've told you multiple times that I hate that game. That's not how I remember it. You've even made some super cool fan art of the game. Why would you do that for a game you hate? Because... shut up. I rest my case. I've talked about this game a lot over the years. I even did an entire video on its importance to me way back at the beginning of my channel's life. So I should probably keep this pretty short, but (laughs) we'll see. I think the reason I liked Donkey Kong 64 so much, though, is the same reason I love a lot of the games on this list. It took an inherently 2D series and made it work in 3D. E64 did this successfully for a lot of series. That on its own is nothing new. But DK64 could just have easily have gone the Kirby 64 route and mixed 3D visuals with more traditional 2D gameplay. Every other future title in the series did, after all. Instead, it dared to be different. And while the sheer amount of collectibles can be overwhelming a lot of the time, and the controls are overly clunky and too reliant on the crouch button, I think this is a game that really brought Donkey Kong to a new level as a series, and also helped define the collectathon genre even to this day. One of the best elements of the game was the non-linearity, as different colored banana trails lead the way to different challenges for the five playable Kongs you unlock throughout the game. Past DK games had more of a superfluous tag-along mechanic where you just need to swap or throw your Kong companion to solve certain puzzles, but they mostly played the same and just acted as a second life if one got hit. This game drastically changed that up by giving major identifying characteristics to each Kong, much of which have stuck with him to today. Diddy and his rocket barrels on Peanut Shooter, for example, are a big part of not only his Smash Bros. moveset, but also his playable differences in newer games like Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Also, 
The idea of instruments was drastically increased in this game after only being touched on in past games during end of level victory dances. And that's weird to me because music is such a large part of why Donkey Kong as a franchise is so iconic. Grant Kirkhope is a master of his craft, and DK64 is a majorly iconic part of his legacy, mostly due to the excellent DK rap during the game's intro sequence, but all the music in that game is amazing. Anyway, I won't get too in the weeds about the greatness of this game. I'd just be repeating myself, and I still stand by the video I made years ago, so just go watch that. But the elements that work about it are some of the best elements of any 3D platformer game. And the ones that are clunky don't ruin the game, for the most part. Though there are some just bad and convoluted level designs in the game, especially the Swamp World. It's really cool that you can swim around as on guard in that level, but it is just not good aside from that. Ugh, sorry. Anyway, I will always hold this game in high regard, because it gave us Lanky Kong. All the Kongs are great, but Lanky... He's right up there with Waluigi on the scale of absurd characters that I need more of in gaming. Seriously, Lanky has had like two appearances outside of this game, and they're cameos at best. It's a travesty. The only exception is his playable appearance in Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, but that game sucks, so it doesn't even count. Can we get Lanky for Smash trending, since Waluigi is never going to happen? Lanky can float. Come on, Nintendo. Make it happen. Now that I'm done gushing, I'll kick it over to VG to start the list proper with a game I've never actually played, but I knew people would complain if it wasn't on the list. Mischief Makers, Mischief Makers is a side-scrolling puzzle platformer developed by Treasure and published by Enix. Based on the box art and the companies behind it, I was expecting a high-octane run-and-gun platformer with RPG elements. Look at that box and tell me it doesn't say bang bang shoot em up! What I got instead was a slow-moving, dialogue-heavy game with one of the most insane control schemes I have ever seen in pretty much any game, let alone on the N64. Going into this video, I had no prior knowledge of this game. I played it for about 20 minutes and was prepared to crap all over it and demand we do something different. Obviously it still made the cut, but I still feel strongly about its placement on the list. I gave it the old college try and decided to fire it up again, because maybe there's just something I was missing, or maybe I was too tired, or I had too much gin that first night, I, I don't know. But whatever the case, holy crap, this game is a gin, and well deserving of some recognition. Yes, it is extremely slow to start. No joke, the first five stages are tutorial to get you adjusted to one of the strangest control schemes I have ever seen. Most of your movement involves double tapping the control pad. One of the few games I can think of on the N64 that doesn't use the joystick at all. Dialogue and story are advanced with the L or R buttons, and your main means of defense are to grab, throw, and shake. The game even goes out of its way to remind you of this, as well as to make sure that you are fully aware that once you get past the tutorial, it's gonna start to get crazy. And get crazy it does. Once the game finally opens up, you are treated with a unique, colorful, vibrant, and incredibly rich game. The story is... Not great. Although well written with some genuine laugh out loud dialogue, it's a pretty cut and dry save the good guy from the bad guys. Also, you're a robot and something about a civil war. Honestly, the story is forgettable, but the game itself is fantastic. While I was expecting to be tossed into a world of shoot all the bad guys and never stop, the game honestly doesn't even lend itself to that. There are a few occasions where you pick up some weapons that will do some serious damage and a really awesome section where, for all intents and purposes, you are driving a giant mech. But for the most part, you'll just find yourself going from beginning to end in the stage. The true joy of this game lies in the fact that you'll be dodging hazards, throwing enemies against walls, and solving devious platforming puzzles. On top of that, it has an extremely catchy soundtrack that's sure to delight any audio file. My personal favorite was the background music from the lava stages. The game looks fantastic as well. It's one of the few games I can think of on the system that's almost entirely sprite-based, aside from a few of the backgrounds. I really wish more games had stuck to this look while they hammered out the details and made the polygons look less, well, bad. Speaking of bad, I can't help but go back to the controls. The N64 is not the best with the controls. In fact, it might be the worst. Chalk that up to being one of the early pioneers of 3D gaming. The 5th gen consoles had a lot of problems not the least of which was figuring out what on earth to do with an omnidirectional camera. Being that this is a 2D side-scroller, the camera wasn't really a problem, but almost all of your movement requires double-tapping the control pad in some way, and the occasional push of the A or B buttons. 
My fingers were sore by the time I finished playing, and I would highly recommend against extensive play sessions. All that being said, Mischief Makers is still a surprisingly delightful, albeit slow to start and awkward to handle, hidden gem in the N64 library. Now, let's move from a game that I never played to a game that a lot of people say they wish they never played, Quest 64. I actually have a lot of respect for this game, and I don't really understand the hate, though I do acknowledge its flaws. Oh yes, the little RPG that tried. Most people know that the Nintendo 64 wasn't exactly known for its excellent RPGs. The only examples I can really think of, other than this one, are Paper Mario and Over Battle 64. Though a quick Google for research also found a game called Aiden Chronicles that I'd never heard of, which just goes to show how little impact RPGs made on the system. Quest 64, though, is one that some people have heard of negatively, but I don't think a lot of people have actually played. And that's a shame, because it actually has a lot of interesting mechanics at play, even if the overall package is a little clunky. You play a young boy mage who goes on, well, a quest to find his father. Along the way, he traverses through various towns to find out what's ailing the world and takes care of the problems in that town or around that town that prevent him from moving forward. It's extremely simple, to the game's detriment, but it's a surprisingly good-looking game for the console, and I think the combat system is actually pretty fun. Battles are random, but play out in a limited free roam battle arena, and the character can attack or use one of four elemental magics that are upgraded as you explore, giving incentive to go off the beaten path to find all the upgrade spirits scattered around the world. Back to battle, once you move and use an action, your character is frozen while the enemies move. Your placement on the battlefield is crucial to whether the enemies will be able to hit you, as some can only attack up close and have limited movement range, while others have long ranged attacks and it's beneficial to stay right up on their grills, pelting them with close-up magic. <sighs> no, not that kind of close-up magic. The more you battle, the stronger you get. As in lieu of a traditional level up mechanic, the game buffs various stats as you use them. So the more you get hit, the more your defense increases, the more you do damage, the more your attack increases. It's a mechanic that has worked well in past games like Elder Scrolls, but in this game it can be challenging because there's no money system in the game or even a barter system, or even any way to sell your body for good. Uh, he's a little boy, I think I took that too far. Anyway, in some weird Gene Roddenberry inspired world, this game just gives everything out for free. So the only way to get more curative or status healing items is by tracking down treasure chests, fighting monsters for loot, or talking to characters that just give you things for talking to them. However, the difficulty of combat ramps up extremely quickly, so you'll find yourself taking way more damage than you have the ability to heal, and no way to just buy more items to make up the difference. Fortunately, death just means respawning at the last inn, which are weirdly also free of charge. I don't understand this economy. And you keep all progress and items from before your death. It's still an annoying setback, as it could be multiple battles to get back to where you were, and any items you used before death don't come back, but it just encourages you to grind your power to a suitable level before wasting all your items in the first run through an area. This is very much a classic RPG in the vein of the old NES Final Fantasy games, complete with a similar leveling mechanic as Final Fantasy II. But since it's coming out in the N64 era, this level of simplicity mixed with ridiculous difficulty spikes understandably turned away a lot of players back in the day. I appreciate this game for what it is, though, and think it's worth shouting out on a list of games that people didn't give proper merit. Well, I never played Quest 64 myself, though I am aware of its reputation. Since we're on the subject of unnecessarily difficult games, let's talk about Chameleon Twist. Well, <laughs> I never played that one, so take it away. Did you ever wonder what would happen if, in Alice in Wonderland, instead of the main character being a little girl, the main character was a reptile? Well, neither did I, but apparently the good people at Sunsoft took that challenge and thus gave us Chameleon Twist. The game starts with you as one of four chameleons, Davy, Jack, Fred, or Linda, on an average day doing chameleon stuff. You know, like sitting on a stump, I guess? A suspiciously familiar, totally not copyright infringing rabbit comes along, jumps in a portal, 
and gosh, your curious little chameleon just can't resist the urge to follow him in. Emerging on the other side, you'll discover you've taken on a slightly humanoid and definitely not at all creepy form. Ultimately, your goal is to make it back home. Chameleon Twist is a pretty unique platformer. As one of the four chameleons, you will traverse treacherous pitfalls, collect items, and gobble up bad guys. The main mechanic that sets this game apart from others of its type is your tongue. You'll be using it as your main means of defense and traversal, and it is fairly versatile. Your main attack is to shoot your tongue out in front of you, and you're able to then use the joystick to move the tongue around to grab power-ups, enemies, or even grab onto certain stage hazards. Once you've grabbed an enemy in your mouth, you can then fire them back out, which comes into play for the boss battles. It's sort of like if Yoshi was a weird, big-headed baby. As you move through the stage, you'll find yourself matched with what appears to be impassable gaps or insurmountable ledges. What's a chameleon to do? All right, the tongue. As I mentioned before, you can also use your tongue to grapple certain stage hazards, usually in the form of a wooden pole, allowing you to pass by. You'll either be able to retract your tongue and bring yourself to the other side, or spin yourself around the pole to reach the other side. Additionally, when met with a tall cliff, you're able to shoot your tongue out below you to gain some height, or you can do this same move while in motion to gain a bit of distance. These movement options can take a lot of getting used to, but with a bit of practice, you'll be able to tear through this game in an afternoon. Or be like me and fall down the same cliff 18 times until you rage quit. The biggest complaint I have about this game is the graphics tend to be pretty muddy, making judging distance a big problem, especially in later stages when the platforming gets cranked to 11. Not only that, many of the smaller mobs are just low-res sprites, and they stand out starkly against the otherwise fully rendered backgrounds. Then of course, there's the camera. Basically, it stinks. The default is they have the camera button only panning, but the free camera isn't a whole lot better as it has many of the problems which plague early 3D games. Restricted movement, and a propensity to run into walls. All that being what it is, Chameleon Twist is overall a fun, unique take on the platformer genre that a lot of people may have overlooked because of the unusual controls and bizarro concept. All your talk about a charming but hard to control 3D platformer makes me reminiscent for one of my favorite games I owned as a kid. Glover. Oh man, I also love Glover. I never owned it, but I rented it a lot and just kind of messed around with the cheats. It was kind of amazing. But did you like the actual game? I mean, yeah, but I don't think I'd put it on a top 10 list or anything. Well, I would, and it's next, so I'd appreciate it if you'd still give me a hand. <sighs> <sighs> Who would have thought they'd make a game out of Master Hand from Smash Bros? Wait, the story of this game is way weirder and more ridiculous than that? Oh. Yeah, okay, that checks out. Glover is the story of a wizard who literally and metaphorically dips his hands into magic he doesn't understand and accidentally creates a super evil handman named Cross Stitch that cloaks the realm in darkness and just wants Glover to have a bad day for some reason, I guess. He's probably just bitter because he was the masturbation hand. Anyway, the wizard's castle explodes and the, like, crystals of peace or whatever that protect the realm from darkness go flying in all directions. The good hand man, our hero, uses his wizard magic, I guess, to transform the crystals into harmless bouncy balls until he can return them to safety. Because video games. So, this game is all about traversing levels full of enemies and traps using the magic ball, which can be transformed into a bowling ball, ball bearing, or the actual crystal if you want to just immediately shatter it and become the real villain. Most of the time, you'll use the bouncy ball to jump up ledges, activate switches, and do other obligatory platforming game things, but the other forms have their benefits too. The bowling ball is heavy and can be used to break things or sink to the bottom of pools of water, and the ball bearing is more precise and easier to throw. The reason I like Glover so much is because it's unique. While most mascot platformers are all about running, jumping, and flipping around in sandbox world, Glover is a slower, more challenging affair, with a playable character as just a vessel to get the object from point A to point B. You can leave the ball at the beginning of each level, run to the end, and nothing will happen. The game doesn't really care that much about Glover's abilities, and it's also fairly easy to get around without the ball, so it wouldn't even be that fun. Instead, the game's design is all based around making you hate physics. Think of it like if Super Monkey Ball had a jump button. 
Need to get to the top of a hill. Whoops, there's a fire in the way. Need to go upstairs. <laughs> yeah, good luck bouncing your ball up there without getting hit. Need to collect something to open the end door. Have fun controlling the ball backwards over water, sucker. The controls don't make any of this easier, and at times the platforming can feel frustratingly unforgiving, but it's also unique in a way that no game since has managed to capture. Especially since the planned Glover sequel was ultimately scrapped, so we'll probably never get anything else like it. It's not all about just rolling or bouncing a ball around a level, either. There are various potions that make Glover super fast or stick to walls, and these elements help to mix up the gameplay in fun ways. All in all, Glover dares to be different on a console packed with attempts at 3D platforming adventure games, and it deserves its recognition for what it tried to do. Even if some of the implementation was frustrating and the controls held it back from being the next great franchise. It's just a shame no one ever finished Glover 2. Maybe the series would still be around if it had a second chance to prove its worth. I guess my little anthropomorphic love buddy is just going to have to live on in my heart. And balls. Uh, bouncy balls. Because, you know, never mind. It's awkward now. Speaking of weird anthropomorphic things brought to life, did you ever play the Clay Fighter game on Nintendo 64? Not that one, but I loved the NES games as a kid. I just didn't know the series continued after that. Oh man, it was a great series, but sadly the N64 entry was the last one. I wish they'd bring it back like they did with Killer Instinct recently. Ugh, that would be amazing. Picture Clay Fighters fighting in 3D with modern technology. I need this now. Um, yes please. In the meantime, I'll tell you more about this one. Clay Fighter 63 and a third. The Clay Fighter series basically started out as a joke, and a way to muscle in on the big bucks that Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat were drawing in. What it is now is, well, a dead franchise. But the most recent entry in the series, Clay Fighter 63 and a third, still holds a lot of charm. On the surface, Clay Fighter is just another fighting game. But digging a little deeper, you'll find irreverent charm, colorful characters, and a surprisingly fun fighter for what basically amounts to a parody of the genre. Depending on which version of the game you're playing, because yes, of course there are multiple versions, more on that later, you will choose from a roster of between 9 and 16 characters, including Bad Mr. Frosty, a once evil snowman turned good, because video games, Ichabod Clay, a clear parody of Ichabod Crane, Blob, a literal blob of clay, or Kung Pao, a Chinese caricature that's so blatantly racist, even the fighters from Punch-Out are like, dude, maybe tone it down a bit. There are a few additional characters to unlock, but rather than having to play through the single player game to unlock them, you can simply jam in a couple of cheat codes and you're good to go. That being said, all the characters play similarly enough that in my opinion, it's worth it maybe once or twice for the novelty. As I previously touched on, there is a second version of this game, Sculptor's Cut. It wouldn't truly be a Street Fighter parody without a superfluous second edition, now would it? Although Clay Fighter 63 and 2 thirds is a way better joke. Sculptor's Cut includes several characters that were cut from the original version due to time constraints, or apparently the too controversial Hobo Cop, better balance between fighters, and a full cinematic opening that has one of the most ridiculous songs that I cannot help but love. What makes this version of the game truly unique was that it was exclusively available as a rental at Blockbuster, making physical cartridges so rare that there's really only one way to play it. Clay Fighter is a game that is built on its irreverent humor and loving send-up of the genre. Weird racism aside, the game itself is still pretty fun and entertaining. The single-player portion of Clay Fighter is frankly not great. Not only is it extremely short, but the AI has an uncanny ability to come out of nowhere and pummel you with a 30-hit combo. It does offer a versus option, and really what's more fun than beating the crap out of your buddies? The characters all have a full range of dialogue, voiced by some serious heavy hitters in the voice acting community, such as Jim Cummings, Tress McNeil, Frank Welker, Jess Harnell, and Dan Castellaneta. Some of the voice clips can get grating when you hear them over and over, Kringle Crush. The Kringle Crush. but the presentation of the game is otherwise well done. The fighters are made of sprites and put in 3D rendered stages. The stiff, jerky movement works surprisingly well, considering they're all supposed to be made of clay. Clay Fighter works because it's easy for anybody to pick up and play. Rather than having to learn the nuances of each character, it mostly boils down to remembering the most basic fighting game moves. Do you know how to do a Hadouken or a Shoryuken? Then you can do most of the moves in Clay Fighter. 
Each character also has super combos that are equally easy to pull off, as well as fatal- er, sorry, claytalities. But those involve a bit more studying. Fortunately, they're just flashy and won't leave a novice player weeping in a pool of clay. If you're looking for a unique take on the fighting game genre, you can do a lot worse than Clay Fighter 63 and a third. Jingle this all the way. Man, that sounds awesome. You know what? I'm gonna go play that right now. Okay, but we're recording a video right now? Eh, it's fine. This is a good stopping point anyway. I need to go beat up an evil snowman right now. Bye, everyone. All right, I guess we'll be back later with the top five. Hey, can I play it with you? A meteor crash one fateful day turned my little creatures into clay with heroes bent on doing right and twisted foes up for the fight. Clay fighter! One to one, they set the stage. Clay fighter! Clay